Uh, now, most Christians, most religious people, most Christians, what they try to do, what they want to do, is smooth over that difference and make it appear that it's one continuous whole. Well, there's one continuous whole in the sense that it's God on both sides of old and new. But I'll tell you what, something happened between old and new that made all the difference in the world. And His name is Jesus. Now, if Jesus didn't change the relationship between God and man, then He didn't need to come. Did you hear that? But because He came, He changed the fundamental relationship between God and man. In the Old Testament, things are different than they are now in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, God Himself used fear as a primary motivating factor for people under that covenant. It's not that way today, but I want to talk about how it was so you can see the contrast. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 12, uh, let me see, verse uh, 18. Uh, Elliot, if you could bring me that uh, for a second. I want you to notice this. This is, uh, the writer of the Hebrews makes a lot of contrast between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And he says here in verse 18, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18, he says, For you are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor into blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned, or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Now, what is the writer describing in this passage? He's describing the giving of the law on Mount Sinai and all the things concerned with it. And the people said to Moses, you go up and talk to God. We don't want to hear his voice. We're terrified of this God and his commandments. And Moses himself said, as it says here, Moses himself, the mediator of the old covenant, the mediator of the law, said, I exceedingly fear and quake. If we look at the uh, details of the law, the details of the Old Testament, and my uh, favorite place to look at that is in Deuteronomy chapter 28, if you turn there for just a second. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, the first 14 verses are devoted to the blessings of obedience to the law. 14 verses uh, have the blessings of obedience. And it starts off this way in Deuteronomy chapter 28, uh, verse 1. It says, It shall come to pass if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God and observe to do all. And the emphasis here should be on the word all. That's, that's where Paul puts the emphasis when he quotes this verse. Uh, to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God shall set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And then he begins to list blessings for doing all that the Lord commands. Fourteen verses contain the blessings. But then in verse 15, we have something else. Look at verse 15, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 15. It shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Now we had 14 verses of blessing, but you know how many verses are devoted to the curses? Chapter, uh, verse 15 through 68. Three times as many verses telling us about the curses as there are telling us about the blessings. Why are three times as many verses? Did I get the math right on that? Let's see, chapter, uh, verse 1 through 14 is the blessings, 15 through 68 curses. Help me math students. Elliot, is that about three times as many? Almost, yeah. Yeah, okay, it doesn't matter. Way more. <laughs> yeah, math's not my subject. <laughs> Way more. Way more verses devoted to the curses. And not only that, not only are there more, uh, notice what some of them say. Look at verse 60, for instance. Here's one of the curses. Verse 60 says this, Moreover, he will bring upon... This is the curses for disobedience to the law. Moreover, he will bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt, which thou wast afraid of, and they shall cleave unto thee. He points out he, that you were afraid. I will bring those things that you were afraid of. What, what's he doing? He's motivating them by fear. Now, if you read the rest of the verses, even though the word fear doesn't appear in every verse, that's the underlying thought. Uh, another one... Uh, in verse 66, look at that one. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shalt have none assurance of thy life. God is using fear as a motivation, just like we talked about in public school. The fear of punishment, the fear of all these curses, the fear of all these diseases. Now, I want to tell you that, I'm sorry to tell you this, and it shouldn't be this way, but it's true. In the church world today, not Old Testament Israel that we just read, but in the church world today. Mostly, what most preachers try to do is motivate us to be good the same way, by fear. 
And people who are trained that way, and I'm going to tell you why it's, it shouldn't be that way, why it's not that way in just a minute. Uh, when you begin to talk to them about the grace of God and the love of God, first of all, it sounds like some strange thing they never heard of before. And secondly, they can't, it doesn't equate. It doesn't make sense. Now, most of you know, or you might know, because uh, I mention it every now and then, on Sunday nights, uh, I, I don't, we don't have a church service here because I have a church service at BJCC at the prison here. And I go out there, I've been doing that for years. Charlie Janet have come with me at a time or two after that. Remember that? Remember how those guys are? Yeah, they finally built a chapel there so we don't have to sit in those little classrooms. But uh, anyway, we uh, have church services there, and I go there, and you know what? I don't tell them God's going to get you. I don't try to motivate them by fear because we have a different motivation now. In fact, let me, let's just talk about it, and I'll tell you what. Uh, look at First John chapter, we were singing from First John, First John chapter 4, verse 18. John's first epistle, not the gospel of John, but John's first epistle, and I'll just tell it to you. And then I'll tell you what uh, the experience I had out there. Uh, let's see. Look at verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Now, when he's talking about love here, of course, we've jumped into this in verse 18, right in the middle of this discussion. Now, if you back up just for a moment to verse 9 and 10, we'll see what he means by love. He says in verse 9, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. And verse 10 then says, Herein is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sins. A propitiation means a sacrifice. A sacrifice that is good enough. A sacrifice that is satisfactory to meet the demands of justice. Now, it says that God loved us and sent Jesus to be the sacrifice to meet the demands of justice. What does justice demand, by the way? Justice demands that we should be punished for our own sins, just like I got the ticket for running through the, the traffic line or the, uh, the stop sign. Justice demands that in the, court, in the divine court of justice, we should be punished, according to justice, we should be punished for our wrongdoing. But because God loved us so much, He sent Jesus to take our place. That's what he says. Now, go back to verse 18 again. When he says in verse 18, there is no fear in love. Perfect love casteth out fear. The love, he means, is defined by what he just got through saying. Love meaning God so loved us that he sent Jesus to take our place and be the propitiation. He said that knowledge of that love, if, we, if it's perfectly formed, if we have a perfect conception of that love, it should take fear completely out of the picture. So when I preach to you and the men of the prison and anybody really that's what I want to do I want to take fear completely out of the picture and I find that when I talk about grace and the grace of God if it is received it will do that but here's the experience I had I had a man come up to me and I talk about grace all the time that's my main subject God's not mad at you he said Jesus take your place I could talk hour after hour I could talk till the sun goes down about that subject because there's so much to say about it and if you'll receive it it'll create faith on the inside of you Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And that's the Word of God that creates faith. And by grace you're saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God. Uh, that's what we need to hear to create faith. But I had a man come up to me. You know what, what I find is at the church services at the prison, they're not required to go. They don't have to go. They go if they choose to go. And mostly the men that go are men who have grown up in church or have been in church and then they you know, made some bad decisions or got in trouble or... You know, whatever happened, they find themselves there, and then they want to get their lives back on track, and, I, and that's a good motivate. That's a good thought. So they'll come to church, and uh, and I'll tell them about the grace of God because the reason I do that is I want them. If they, you know what, if they'll take hold, and not just them, you, me, us too, you and me too. If anyone will take hold of the grace of God, it'll change your life, and we'll talk about it how in just a moment. But that's why I do it. Uh, so a man came up to me afterwards who evidently was raised in one of those denominations, maybe I, maybe like I just told you about, where conform to the world meant uh, behavior, different kinds of behavior, different kinds of uh, actions of behavior. He came up to me, and I, now listen to this now, after one of our services, and he said to me, I don't understand what you're talking about. I don't like it. When I hear you preach, it, listen to this. This will make you cringe, but this is what he said. When I hear you preach, it makes me want to sin. What does that mean? I'm taking away the fear, and the only thing he's ever known to control his behavior is fear. 